Kharkiv, as is known, is the scientific, cultural and educational center of Ukraine. What was the effect of war on these spheres? What are the future prospects? How the scientific is and cultural community experiencing modern challenges? Today we are discussing these and other issues in the new project, Perspectives, in which we plan to synthesize the conversation about culture, science and education. Greetings, this is the project, Perspectives. Today's guest of our program is the poet, novelist, essayist, musician, public figure, volunteer Sergei Jadon. Good day. Good day. Sergei Jadon was born on August 23, 1974. Ukrainian writer, translator, public figure, frontman of the bands Jadon and Dogs, and Mannerheim Line. Sergei Jadon's literature works have been recognized by numerous national and international awards, translated into more than 20 languages, making the author one of the most famous modern Ukrainian writers. Sergei Jadon is an active organizer of the literary life of Ukraine and a participant in multimedia art projects. In 2017, he founded the charitable foundation of Sergei Jadon. Mr. Sergei, the first question is probably banal, but in my opinion important. The beginning of the war, the Great War. Where did you meet it? How did you face it? First thoughts, first actions? Your opinion, please. I remember it very well. I met it on the train, because the musicians and I were supposed to be on tour, and it just started on February 24th, there was supposed to be a concert in Vinitsia. And accordingly, we all left Kharkiv, the musicians left a little earlier, and I caught up with them by train. And I remember that the manager woke us up on the morning of February 24th. We drove through Kiev and he said that a full-scale war had begun, shelling had begun. We met at the station in Kozayatin. We boarded our tour bus and drove back to Kharkiv. I remember very well the 24th of February, and it was such a stream of cars going west. People were leaving Kharkiv, leaving Dnipro, leaving Kiev, evacuating their families, and we were returning and there were not many cars going to the east, mostly military units, which were urgently transferred to the east. Actually, on the evening of February 24th, we were already here and immediately got involved in the work. Because our team has been engaged in volunteering since 2014 and, in principle, we understood what was coming at us and what should be done, so we immediately got involved in our activities. Since February 25th, we began visiting our familiar military personnel who were standing within the borders of Kharkiv, holding the defense. We went to northern Saltivka, we went to Rogan, where our friends and acquaintances were stationed, started working, started helping. To the essence of our program, Kharkiv is a city of education, culture, and science. It is hard to imagine our city without this triad. You have a touch of all these three directions. You are involved in education, science, and culture. Tell me, please, from the point of view of a person who is deeply immersed in these areas, what problems do we have at this time? through the prism of the present, and what are the prospects? Prospects are determined by problems, and our problems are global and systemic. I agree with you, Kharkiv was, and I hope, will be a city of education and culture, but education and culture in these conditions turned out to be the most vulnerable and the most defenseless. Because if, for instance, a business can be transferred, an enterprise, production facilities can also be transferred, a location can be made in another city, the situation with culture is much more difficult. You and I are tied to our institutions, tied to our locations, theaters to their stages, museums to their walls, libraries to their funds, bookstores to their shelves. Accordingly, all this can only function in its home environment, otherwise it is a very big compromise. And since the pre-war conditions are no longer available since February 24, the culture cannot function properly, so the main aspect is currently the security, and I think that you, as the head of this theater, understand this perfectly. You can't risk people, neither those on the stage nor those in the hall. This is risk is unacceptable and, accordingly, we have to adapt to new realities, and new realities are not very conducive to cultural activity.
Accordingly, it is necessary to look for new options and new methods. For me, for example, since the beginning of the full-scale invasion of Kharkiv, as we have talked a little with you here before the beginning of this interview, Kharkiv is a city of theaters, using the scenery built before the war. This was exactly the case in the Puppet Theater, and in the Shevchenko Theater, and, as far as I understand here, in the Opera and Ballet Theater. Accordingly, it is not possible to use these scenes now, we need to look for alternative options, and I see that culture is looking for these alternative options in Kharkiv. And the alternative is primarily related to security. Unfortunately, it is not so easy and not so simple, because of course the city is under fire even today. We are all such a big target for the enemy, who, in principle, does not really understand whether it is a cultural institution or a critical infrastructure object. Probably the opposite. Maybe. After all, considering how many cultural monuments have been destroyed, how many museums have been destroyed, how many objects have been destroyed that were neither infrastructural facilities nor strategic military facilities? It seems to me that the Russians don't care what to destroy. The situation is such that at the moment it seems to me that there is not just a search for new stages, not just new premises, but a search for a new philosophy of preserving some essences. Why do we keep doing it? How much all this is needed by people who are in the cultural industry itself, who are artists and creators, and how much it is needed by the audience itself. As far as I can see, see, it is really necessary. Taking into account what we did here during the last two years, the halls were always full, there was always a large number of visitors, residents of Kharkiv, for whom it is very important to hold on to this cultural sphere. And as for education, the situation with education is even worse, unfortunately, because you yourself see that we do not have offline education, that we have distance education, that Kharkiv, as a city of students and as a city of teachers, is also forced to to accept a new reality. In this reality, many university premises, auditoriums, dormitories, and sports complexes were destroyed. Accordingly, many students and teachers left the city, many foreign students left. In one word, it may look like I complain a little. We must understand that the situation that was in Kharkiv before February 24 does not exist and cannot exist in the conditions of war, and how long the war will last, we cannot say now and no one will. Therefore, it should be understood that we have two choices, either to simply ignore the fact that we need education and culture, or to try to do something in this situation, but how to do it is an issue for discussion. In continuation of this issue, culture, literature, national consciousness, inferiority complex, or, is there a cause and effect relationship in this chain? I know that you are often asked such questions. Can you share your thoughts on this matter? The connection can be traced, the matter is that if we start digging into it, one way or another Another, we come to some disappointing conclusions and self-accusations. It is obvious that adequate self-esteem is necessary, but in this situation, I think, first of all, it should be based on the fact that there is an enemy, there is an occupier, and it was them who started the war, and not some of our internal problems or complexes. Although this does not negate the fact that we need to use this war as a very important, very painful, very dramatic moment that explains a lot for ourselves. I think it should be done as a memory of those who gave their lives and are giving their lives for us. To try to understand what is wrong with us, so that we can fix it and in what way we cannot repeat certain mistakes. Because in fact, if we talk about Kharkiv, it is a specific city, a complex, multi-layered city. This is its strength, this is its potential, but this is its weakness, its vulnerability, and accordingly, there are a lot of stereotypes about Kharkiv, a lot of different, often biased information. And it seems to me that Kharkiv refuted a lot of stereotypes in the spring of 2022, when it carried out a very strong and unequivocal resistance to the enemy, the aggressor, and did not surrender the territory, did not actually surrender to the occupiers. Persisted, withstood this first onslaught and drove the enemies outside the city boundaries. It seems to me that any doubts as to the extent to which Kharkiv is a Ukrainian city, these doubts should disappear. But this this does not mean that we do not have questions about ourselves, 
that we do not have questions about what we have, what we are filled with, what meaning we are filled with. It seems to me that culture, education in this sense are very important components that allow us to guess ions. Indeed, you now notice how many citizens of Ukraine today turn to history, to culture, to education, as to those sources where they can find answers related to self-identity, related to self-understanding, feeling of self in this country, and feeling of this country in general. Culture in this sense, in spite of all its subjectivity, in spite of all its emotionality, in spite of all its involvement and bias that is actually embedded in it, is still a very important factor that helps to manifest and activate some things inside you. A person comes to itself through culture or politics, it seems to me, through education, not through the economy. Although politicians are also very important in the component of our identity. You had a quote, you said that we have certain internal problems. You are a native of Luhansk, by the way, I also have Luhansk roots, my father is from the Luhansk region, but to the whole world you are a Kharkiv citizen. We identify you as a Kharkiv resident. In your opinion, is there a problem between the East and the West for Ukraine, in the past, in the present and in the future? Is there such a problem for Ukraine? in general? No, it seems to me that there is certainly no such problem for Ukraine. I am convinced that this problem was invented from the very beginning, that this concept is artificial, it is more political than ideological. This is an attempt to contrast East and West, an attempt that has been quite effective for a long time. But it seems to me that the war just showed that it is not important, that our problem does not go along this axis, not along this division and not along these east-west markers. Rather, we should talk about Ukraine and not Ukraine. It is clear that we are all different and the society in Ukraine is different, some care about Ukraine, some accept its statehood, some accept its identity, and some stubbornly refuses to do this, stubbornly ignore it and it does not matter where a person lives, in the south, north, west or east of Ukraine. Look at those who are fighting in the armed forces, in the Ukrainian army, who is defending Ukraine. There are citizens of Ukraine, Ukrainian men and women from virtually all regions. From the west, from the east, from the south, from the north. That's why this issue of a person's connection to its country is not about regions, it is something different. It's always a very difficult choice and a complicated story, a very complicated background, and you don't know what drives a person when he picks up a weapon and goes to defend his country. Бекграунд, і ти ніколи не знаєш, власне, чим людина керується, що людину веде, коли вона бере, наприклад, руки зброю і йде захищати свою країну. Тобто це більше це ментальне питання, чи не? That is, it is more of a mental issue. I am saying, of course, that it is very easy for someone to draw regional differences under this, but this is already a map from the past and I really want to believe that after our victory, after the end of this war, we will not allow ourselves to be divided into the left bank and the right bank, Easterners and Westerners, because this is too great a luxury, we have wasted a lot of time, energy and potential on this. I was at the Opera Europe forum and talked there with my colleagues from the European opera community, that is, quite a wide cultural circle, and I was unpleasantly impressed, because in the official part of the event, not a single word was said about Ukraine. Moreover, there have been certain trends concerning Russian culture, and certain people even have the opinion that it is necessary to treat Russian culture with understanding, they say that not everything is so clear-cut. I know that already during the war, you went to Europe and communicated with your fans there. Have you seen this view on the Russian-Ukrainian cultural relations from the Europeans? How should we respond to this? How do you see this problem? Через призму цього європейського погляду на 
російсько-українські культурні взаємовідносини. Як ви це бачите? Це, як нам треба на це реагувати? Ну, це доволі, доволі незручна позиція, тому що якщо в політичному сенсі, скажімо, там от все... This is a very uncomfortable position. If in the sense of political attitude, political support for Ukraine as a state, it seems to me that the whole world is more or less unanimous, and it is clear that we are supported by European society, the United States, other countries that understand that everything is quite unambiguous, everything is quite black and white, there is an aggressor, there is an occupier, and there is a country that is trying to defend itself, to resist. Then in the cultural sphere, everything is much more complicated. Because culture is not based on such unequivocalness, it is not based on the principles of black and white, there are a lot of nuances, a lot of specific components. The emotional component embedded in culture means that there are many reasons to question one point of view or another. Culture is an area where Russia quite successfully defends its priorities defends its image and defends its right to some kind of cultural expansion. It's actually very difficult to do anything about it because it's a pretty easy field for manipulations. Because when someone of the Europeans says that there are Russian soldiers who kill Ukrainians with machine guns in their hands, but there is a culture and it doesn't kill allegedly. They say that it should be divided and it should be realized that there are bad Russians and there are good Russians. On the one hand, there is some logic in this, and on the other hand, if we are honest and frank, we understand that culture, if we take it seriously, if we do not take culture lightly, we understand that culture is an important component of any worldview, any political, any state concept. Let's say for us Ukrainians, Ukrainian culture is an important component that connects us all, which is the same through and through thread that stitches very different voices, very different political views very different language preferences. Accordingly, for the Russians, their culture is an important component of this whole concept of the Russian world. Because when you remove Russian culture from the Russian world, what will remain there, tanks, submarines, and uranium storages. Obviously, Russians understand that culture is also important to them. It is even a very important weapon, a very important component of promoting their identity, their positioning. They have been using it quite skillfully and effectively for a long time. In principle, the Russian Empire has always promoted its cultural narratives quite efficiently and effectively, they were good at it, they managed to do it to this day, and accordingly, it should be perceived as part of this confrontation. I understand that even in Ukraine there is a part of our fellow citizens who say that they are ready not to accept Putin, but why touch poets such as Yesenin or Pushkin? And here it is already difficult to explain to people that you have nothing against Pushkin's poetry or against Yesenin's poetry, but you just want to stay alive and keep your country whole and independent. And accordingly, in this case, any Russian cultural figure is a certain marker, a certain flag, which is installed on someone else's territory and then a war is waged for this territory, hostilities are conducted. And this is exactly how it works, and I it seems to me that not to understand it means consciously or unconsciously close eyes and fall into a kind of childishness, but nevertheless I constantly face it now and not only now, but also faced it in the past in Europe, when empathy is manifested when it comes to culture, when it comes to some humanistic sphere. Unfortunately, my next question is about Vishivani. Before we talk about Vishivani, I would like to complete the answer to the previous question a little. It is clear that the world lives by some of its historical stereotypes. Just like what we know about Austria, what we know about Austrian history, what stereotypes we have about Austria. It is clear that they are also associated with some historical events and most importantly with the interpretation of these historical events and the manner they were interpreted to us. The interpretation on which we grew up. Because the Austrians may have their own vision of the concept of, for example, Central Europe, but we have a completely different one. 
And accordingly, they have their own understanding of what Eastern Europe is like as a whole, what the Slavic world is like as a whole, and when you tell them that these stereotypes are not really true, they have a hard time accepting it. Because it is a breakdown of stereotypes, it requires revision of notions important to you, related to education, related to cultural background, related to some personal connections and so on. Returning to your previous question, regarding interaction or rather the impossibility of interaction between Ukrainian and Russian culture in the near future. Here we must also understand that this war is ongoing here, we are 30 to 40 kilometers from the Russian border, the Russian troops were standing 10 kilometers away. On the boundaries of the city along the circular road, and we're shelling the center of this city with artillery. And accordingly, we have the right to our bias, to our emotionality and to our views, to our attitude to Russian statehood, and to the Russian idea, and to Russian culture, in particular. On the other hand, the average citizen of, for example, Germany or the average citizen of France did not have to hide from Russian fire, and he has his own right to interpret these things. And it is clear that the Russians use this opportunity, they actively promote their narratives. What does it mean? We can take offense and claim that we won't do business with someone who doesn't understand it, or we can actively, effectively, and intelligently promote our narratives. It seems to me that this is still a more constructive way. This is a normal, competently strategically formed cultural policy that the Ukrainian state should have, and it seems to me that it is really important. Because it is a goal for the future. It is clear that our freedom, our independence, our future are defended by the Ukrainian armed forces, but if we think and plan events one step ahead, then we must understand what will happen tomorrow. If, for example, we imagine that the hostilities have ended, we must realize what we have left inside our country and with what we can go out into the world, what will we say to the world? It seems to me that this is what awaits us ahead, the formation of our competent, strategic cultural narratives. Now now we can proceed to the question about Vishivani. Because for us it is a personal issue, because Vassal Vishivani Wilhelm Habsburg is a figure who really belongs to both European culture and our Ukrainian culture. Vishivani, the king of Ukraine, the libretto for the opera, was written by the Ukrainian writer Seriai Zhadon. 200 artists were involved in the production, and a three-tier scenery structure was installed on the stage. The construction was built according to the principle of a Ukrainian vertep. This opera is the most expensive production since independence noted its producer Alexander Sayenko. The question about Vassal Vishivani, about the opera, is the following. You started writing the libretto for it when the Ukrainian-Russian war had already started, but was still not in its hot phase since 2014. And at that time you started writing this libretto for the opera. For you personally, is it history or is it still a look into modernity? In fact, I would not separate these things, because Ukrainian history is so alive and so painful that it is largely formative for us. For us, history is not something frozen, on the one hand, it is very uncomfortable, because it constantly requires rethinking a lot of often painful, often rather uncomfortable questions. And on the other hand, it is still a source of great energy and very serious decisions. Our history, I mean. Accordingly, I knew about Bashivani before, for me he was a very interesting character, because the story of Bashivani is not only a story about military actions. And not only about the consolation of the empire, not only about redrawing of borders and not only about the military defeat of the Ukrainian People's Republic, it is primarily a matter of choosing Ukrainian identity. This was a very relevant issue for Ukrainians or people related to the Ukraine 
Ukrainian idea of Ukrainian statehood 100 years ago, and paradoxically, it is relevant for Ukrainians today. Because again, this big war, this full-scale invasion, it suddenly activated the search for identity for so many of us. For very many of us, even those who considered themselves pro-Ukrainian citizens and those who were absolutely neutral towards their country and even those who were quite skeptical about Ukrainianness. It is precisely in this aspect that the story of Vashivani is so interesting, very instructive and very revealing. As a person who could make any choice, he made a choice in favor of the seemingly absolutely marginal idea of Ukrainianness. The choice is conscious, the choice is deep, the choice is meaningful, and it is very interesting how a person devoted himself to this idea, how he put his life on it, and how he was a role model for many, was really an example for many. And remains such an example to this day. Behind this is a sense of conscience, a sense of ethics, a sense of the very empathy that we talk about here all day. And just a feeling of great love, so it seems to me that the story of Vashivani is not so historical, it is rather really about us today and it is about the fact that, by and large, we have this historical burden that cannot be forgotten, that should not be abandoned. I hope that we will be able to resume this performance very soon. I remember these premier demonstrations of this opera very well, indeed. Everyone is asking us when we will be able to show it again. I think we will work in this direction. Continuing the question of your creative activity. Please tell us about your recent works and your creative plans, can you share them? In the conditions of the war, it is difficult to talk about creative plans, but one way or another, I am constantly writing something new, I am currently writing a book of stories, some poems are being written, the musicians and I are making new projects, so, I think, if everything goes well, if nothing extraordinary happens, some new books and musical compositions will appear this year. Something like this. We'll be looking forward for this. God grant. And I hope that here, in the walls of the Kharkiv Opera and Ballet Theater, we will hold a premiere or a presentation or a concert. Well, I guess if there is inspiration, something will probably happen. The circumstances are such that today the main issue is the support of the Ukrainian army. Everything else is secondary, everything else is in the second place. The other side of your creativity is the music band, Jadon and Dogs. You are the frontman of this band. We are all looking forward to your performances. Tell me, please, what are your plans in this direction? We have now taken a break due to certain changes in our lives. Accordingly, we have a little time to work in the studio, so if everything goes well, we will also present something new this year. I hope this presentation will be held here at our theater. Of course. I think that first of all we will turn to you. Igor, you see, on the one hand, it is clear how important cultural life is and it is clear that today for many Ukrainians it is important to go to concerts of classical music and popular music, academic music and some cultural events, theater performances. On the other hand, it is clear that all this is happening in the conditions of a full-scale war, in conditions when our army holds the front, in conditions of daily deaths of soldiers. Destruction of houses, constant tension. Someone can compare these realities, where your civic activity can end and there should still be an opportunity for your cultural interests, and someone does not feel this and says that culture is not in time. It seems to me that everyone has to make this choice for themselves, but one way or another, touring today, giving performances, is emotionally very difficult. When you see that many people are traumatized by this war. In many families, someone is fighting, someone came from the front line. We always have a lot of soldiers at our concerts, many of these soldiers are wounded. It is quite difficult to witness.
I understand that it is a sin for us to complain. If you have the opportunity to speak, the opportunity to do your job, to do your business it's a great luxury, it's really a great happiness and it's a reason to once again thank our military but it should first of all be an opportunity to help the military. You also perfectly understand that today culture is a great field for volunteer activities. Most of our performances are voluntary, funds are collected, donated to the army, some important stuff is bought. It seems to me that this is also a very important component of today's life. When we all understand that we have to support our army, otherwise tomorrow we won't have the opportunity for concerts, plays, tours, or anything. People come to our performances, our concerts, when people leave our concerts with tears in their eyes, we understand how important emotional support is for our population. Because it is very difficult to survive without it. Such a very hot issue now, mobilization, we understand that it is a necessity. However, there are many disputes, actually not about the mobilization itself, but about the form of mobilization and everything else. In the context of our program, education, science, culture, is there a need for some exclusivity, some specificity of mobilization in these areas? освіта, культура. Чи є тут з вашої точки зору якась винятковість чи якась, так сказать, специфічність мобілізації в нашій от сфері, яких це ми? No, what exclusivity can we talk about? There is a law and it must be followed. It seems to me that the law should work for everyone. The last question we ask everyone who is here on the stage of the Kharkiv National Opera. If given such a chance, what character would you like to play? роль, якщо була така можливість, ви хотіли би зіграти. Чи You know, in fact, I have a very great desire, a very great need, just to come to the theater hall and see what is happening on the stage. I have great nostalgia for theater performances, ballet productions, and opera productions. Not to be on stage, not to speak, not to read, but to sit in the hall and watch all this. This role is the most interesting for me, and I need it the most. The role of a viewer. Yes, the role of a viewer, just a grateful viewer. I really want to get to the Kharkiv Opera Theater, to a hall full of visitors. To see the opera about Vishivani? Not even necessarily on Vishivani, just any classical production and listen to the music and singing. Thank you. It was the program, Perspectives. Our guest today was Sariai Jadan, writer, poet, public figure. Thank you, Mr. Sariai. Thank you.